because you may encounter this wherever you're ending up, uh, depending upon where you go, uh, you may encounter this term called a myogram. And a myogram is a graph of tension in the muscle versus time. And you can do various things. If you were in a university scenario and you were in, let's say, a three or 4,000 level physiology class, you very well might likely be doing some myograms where you uh, are measuring the tension in a muscle as a result of doing certain things. So I just wanted to point that out. And remember what we get. We get a brief latent period as ions move and axe potential moves down the sarcolemma. And then when calcium hits the myofibrils in the right concentration, then we begin to see the fibers contract and generate force. Okay, so all the electrical events and ion movements of axe potential, um, excitation, contraction, coupling is occurring right here, and then the contraction begins. Okay, contraction under a single twitch or a single stimulus is going to lead to a certain level of force generated by that set of fibers or a single fiber, and if there are no new, new stimuli, then the fiber will go into relaxation and tension will drop off, okay? So where we ended up is taking a look at how whole muscle is organized. And you can see a whole muscle there with its tendinous attachment to bone. And we can see that there's a lot of muscle that is not shown in the diagram. We can see that there are a grouping of fibers surrounded by connective tissue and that these fibers are innervated. Okay, that's the word for today, innervate. And that is that there is a motor neuron from the central nervous system that sends its axon out to the muscle and has a neuromuscular junction with it. Okay, so we pointed out that three, these three fibers touched or with an NMJ to this red motor neuron are part of a single motor unit. And I made the point that if this neuron carries an impulse for contraction, then all fibers in the motor unit will contract when the impulse reaches. I told you that there is no um, gateway mechanism. Uh, the neuron has no ability to turn off this, this portion of the neuron and only activate these two. If, a, if an axe potential comes from the neuron, it hits all of the fibers at more or less the same time. The motor unit, we have learned, uh, is made up of a, a variable number of muscle fibers. Motor units for body parts that are controlled, let's say body parts that do coarse movements, that don't do a lot of real fine movement, the motor units contain many fibers. But for body parts that are controlled by more fine movements, then what we have are a lot of neurons going to fewer muscle fibers, we have a lot of uh, motor units which are contain just a few fibers. In that way, the brain gets very, very good control over the muscle. Think about this. The more neurons going to a muscle, the more the brain can control just small groups of fibers. That can lead to very fine control, okay? All right. What we're seeing down here, it says, and this would be true for postural type muscles in particular, the ones that you use to, to sit erect, to keep your, your body upright. Motor units usually contract asynchronously, okay? Uh, if I'm holding up an object and continuing to hold it, then I'm calling upon the muscle to stay contracted. What you will read about in your book, if you look at other sources, is that the fibers that are in this contraction eventually will begin to fatigue and so the brain will then call new fibers into the contraction and relax the ones that are reaching the fatigue level, okay? Uh, this is something, again, which is controlled by the central nervous system. And soon, when we start studying the brain, you'll find that a lot of the brain, particularly the lower brain, is all built around doing this, maintaining posture behind the scenes so you don't have to think about it, okay? So you know that you can sit up in a room and you don't have to think about it, although if you, if you get sleepy or tired, you're probably gonna start to lean back, all right? Um, there are big portions of the brain, the lower brain, that are really handling this for you, okay? All right. So 
we're going to take a look at then a little bit more on how a muscle generates the force necessary to do, or how the nervous system and muscle muscular system generate the force needed. When we are not at maximum force or maximum response, the word for that usually is it's a graded response. So we can go from anywhere from no response all the way up to maximum response. And in between then, it's a grade. It's, it's a little bit or a lot. It's 50%, it's 100%, it's, it's all right? So we'll see this term graded uh, over and over again, particularly when we look at the nervous system. The word graded is used to let us know that the action um, can occur on a continuum of strengths, if that makes any sense, okay? The way in which the response is graded, or the two ways, and there's probably others, is by these two mechanisms that we talked about last time briefly. Changing the frequency of stimulation, changing the strength of the stimulation. Now this one gets confusing. Action potentials are always the same strength. So what it comes down to then is how many neurons are involved. So I'll leave that with you just for a moment because I probably didn't get it across all that well. Okay? This one is a little harder to understand. What is the strength of stimulation? You mean action potential goes from little to a lot? Uh uh, action potentials are always the same strength. But if I've got a thousand motor neurons going to a muscle, I can either involve a few of those motor neurons or all of them. And that's where this lies. How many motor neurons are stimulated? and how many are, let's say, controlling the muscle. The more, the higher the force, or the greater the force. Yeah? So when you see something, do you just, do your brain just say, okay, well that's potential, or that, is that how it goes? Well, yeah, you know, um, you spent your early years figuring this out. As I left you last time, as I watched my granddaughter, I see her testing the environment around her, and she is putting into place, at least this is my theory, and it's probably supported by psychologists. She's putting into place memories about how about objects and how they feel, how much they weigh. Um, that is, you know, wood has a different density than concrete. All these sorts of things. Not that she plays with wood or concrete, but soon she will. Um, okay. So yeah, you have to put these into. I mean, her brain is coming online. It's online for the basic stuff: eating, crapping, urinating, that kind of stuff. Okay. But, but to now manipulate her environment, her brain is still coming online and it's learning about her environment, okay? All right, okay, so let's take a look. This is something you've seen before. This is, as you see across the top, it's, you know, it's a myogram, okay? And it says single stimulus, single twitch. We talked about how twitching is, is not something that is commonly used, um, where it's just a single stimulus to control a body part we're talking really more graded responses here. And just refreshing your memory, okay? You have your stimulus, you have a brief, a brief latent period and then a contraction phase followed by relaxation phase, all right? And it says maximal tension of a single twitch. So this means if there is one impulse sent to a motor unit, this is all the force the motor unit can generate with one impulse. But the brain has the ability to do more than that. It has the ability to send multiple impulses, okay? And that will change this graph quite a bit. This is how it might change. Take a look at the red arrows. They are showing us stimulation from a motor neuron to a motor unit. To put that into English, a signal from the central nervous system to a grouping of muscle fibers. The signal is an action potential, okay? So here we see that we see a twitch, basically. And you can see this distance in time is between zero, I mean, it's probably around 80 to 90 milliseconds in time, okay? So count that one second and then divide it by 1,000 and then take 100 of those and you get some idea of how long this is. So there's a twitch. And the, the motor unit is beginning to relax or the fiber, whatever it is, it's beginning to relax and tension is dropping. But if the central nervous system stimulates that motor unit again, the same one or the same fiber again, 
before that fiber has the opportunity to completely relax, then the next contraction will be stronger than the previous one. And again, if a stimulus hits this motor unit before it has the opportunity to, to relax again, it will contract further with greater force. Now what this means in the molecular level is that the first stimulus causes actin to slide towards the center of the sarcomere, okay? And then it begins to slide back as a result of various forces on muscle fiber. But before it can completely slide back and relax that muscle, it, the muscle is hit again and the actin slide towards the center some more. Okay, and before they can slide back further, they're hit, the muscle is hit again with another stimulus and they slide even closer together. And so what's happening is the sarcomere is shortening and then coming apart and then shortening, coming apart, shortening and coming apart. And what you'll find on the next slide is if the stimulus frequency goes way up, then the muscle fiber will simply contract fully. The sarcomeres will shorten fully and that's what we have at the top, okay? So we're building up to it. We're allowing enough time in between stimuli for a little bit of relaxation of the sarcomeres of the muscle fiber. But if we really increase that stimulation rate, then we kind of do away with this tetanatic, tetanatic contraction and we end up with something like a nice smooth contraction that then reaches a limit. At this point, the muscle can generate no, no more force. At this point, the motor unit can generate no more force. Why is that? Actins, myosins are completely overlapped and there is no more room to shorten the sarcomere. Tetanus is the sarcomeres of that motor unit are completely shortened. They can't be shortened any further. We can't generate any more force in that fiber. Let's go back. This is a, a myogram of a motor unit or a single muscle fiber. And what happens when stimulus frequency begins to increase. What we are seeing is that there is a trend towards greater force as stimulus frequency increases. This is called incomplete tetanus because the muscle fibers or the motor unit has not reached complete contraction maximum contraction. But here, as we increase stimulus frequency, notice the time scale again, a lot more stimuli per unit of time. We see a nice smooth contraction up to complete tetanus. Um, can't be contracted any further, okay? So this motor unit will continue to do this until it begins to fatigue or the stimulus frequency decreases. If it begins to fatigue, then the central nervous system will engage another motor unit to take over for it. This motor unit will relax, and another one will get into tetanus again. So we learned that this term tetanus is something a little different than what we knew coming in the room. Tetanus out there is an illness, okay? Something which if you uh, get dirt into a wound, they might give you a tetanus shot to try to pr protect you from it. Tetanus in muscle contraction is complete shortening of the sarcoma. Okay? So you get that that's one way in which to increase force is to increase the stimulus frequency. Another way to increase force is to recruit more of the muscle to the contraction. I alluded to this last time. It's referred to as recruitment or in older books, multiple motor unit summation. Motor unit is grouping of muscle fibers, okay, which are all innervated by the same neuron. Multiple means that we're gonna start adding, not just, we're not just gonna tweak the one motor unit, we're gonna start adding more motor units to the contraction, okay? What does that take? That takes another neuron to stimulate another motor unit, and another neuron to stimulate another. One neuron stimulates one motor unit, but there are multiple motor units in this muscle. So the brain can activate more neurons and stimulate more motor units. It's called recruitment. 